Clubhouse. Welcome to the True Crime TV Podcast, where our hosts cover a variety of these shows, sometimes just one episode, sometimes the whole season. Join us as we get to the bottom of the case together. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today, guys. I've already watched the whole thing, and I was super impressed. Very moody and atmospheric to watch. Um, and I'm actually in Texas, so that was a story I had not heard yet. What about Candy's story? In a world where true crime seems to be bubbling to the top of what people want to consume, both in you know nonfiction and, and fictional formats, what about her story? Rose to the top of all the craziness, all of the you know Florida man, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, <laughs> type stories that are out there to choose from. What interested you guys? When um, Nick initially spoke to me about TV this story, I had never heard it either, which was very sometimes strange because episode, I'm a huge season. true Join crime fan, and it just together. seemed very odd that this one sort of got past me. But when we started first talking about it, the thing that was really appealing to me was just the exploration of female rage that just comes out of stifling you know, repression and control that these women experienced. You know, they were fed prescription when they were kids. You get married, you have the kids, you have the nice house, and then you're happy. And there's no reason to complain otherwise. There's nothing more to look for. And if you weren't happy, it was your fault. So we started talking about it in 2019. And, you know, this, this was coming off of the Me Too movement and everything where it was a horrifying breath of fresh air, I think, for most women in that we were finally able to begin discussing this rage that we have within us because we've been told our whole lives not to express these things, to think of weakness, you know, like no one's going to listen to you, no one's going to believe you or anything. So that was the initial appeal when we started working on it in 2019 cut to 2020 <laughs> and now we're in a world of lockdowns and everything and nick and i were saying like okay now this story feels more universal because now i think everyone can relate to a feeling of having so much expectation put on you you know and do this for the betterment of society do this for the betterment of yourself and of course we're going to do that of course we're going to do that but you just ask me one more thing and i swear to god <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think everyone can identify with being pushed to a point. And, you know, hopefully the majority of people can weather through it. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> don't pick up an axe. <laughs> so I first heard about this story, um, read about it about 20 years ago, and it stuck with me over the years. It's obviously resonant in all the ways that Robbins describes. It also stuck with me because it speaks to the idea that deep with inside all of us, there is something that, if unleashed, could be monstrous. It asks some questions about who we are that I think are, are hard to dismiss and hard to grapple with. And that's what makes a, a true story worth dramatizing. Did you as a creative team, did you have access to anybody from the actual events, from the source material? Did you get to interview anybody from the original cast of characters? We did, actually. We, we had very long conversations and a lot of interaction with Jim Atkinson, who with his partner, John Bloom, was reporting on the story the entire time as it was happening. And both of them did spend a substantial amount of time with all of the players involved, with Candy and Alan and Pat. So these guys knew them intimately. Other than that, we spoke at great length to Robert Udishin, who was one of Candy's lawyers. Don Crowder is no longer with us. And we also spoke to Steve Defabaugh, who goes by Diffie in the show. That was a hoot. But it was it was just really interesting to speak to these people who 41 now, almost years later, are still very it's an ominous number in their feelings. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even do this math. I, I read somewhere <laughs> online that like it's the 41st anniversary coming up, which 41 is a very loaded number in our right. candy world. Yes, <laughs> for sure. And as Robin says, it's really interesting to have Udishin and Steve Defenbaugh talking to the writers' room because they come at the case from different sides and they still really believe the different stories. You know, as Robin often said in the writers' room, the show is 
about perspectives. We only have the perspective of one of the two people who was in that fight. Mm -hmm. And so which version can you believe? We went back and forth so much. And also we had access to a vast amount of trial transcripts and documents from the case. And Jim and John are, are producers on the show as well. So people who were there at the time during the trial and immediately afterward were available to us in conversation with the writers. I know you guys were the writing room, but you're also the showrunner and the creator. So so I, I bet you had some input into the overall aesthetics and the, and the look of the show that you were aiming for. It's interesting, like I, I was just thinking how some shows say like a Stranger Things aims for like a, a nostalgic look at all the bright colors of the 80s, whereas you're at the late 70s and, you're, and, you, and your palette is very muted and muddy. Your cinematographer used a lot of shallow depth of field, especially on the characters. So the background colors were all very just mushed together. And that mush was brown. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, just by looking at it, you're not looking at the 90s. You're not looking at the mid 80s. You know, you're looking at this exact moment in time. That's the irony of this specific time period and the sort of quote unquote town that this took place in. You know, late 70s, early 80s, that was my childhood. And one of the first things I said to Nick when we started working on this was just like, I grew up in this town. It was called Kingsville, Maryland, but it's this town. It's a town that sprung up out of nowhere with these young couples who were leaving the cities to populate the suburbs. And so you have these small towns where all the houses look remarkably the same, except you know if you have a little bit more money. But like you look at the Gore house, we shot in Atlanta. But like, it looks like houses in Maryland. It looks like houses in Texas. It yeah. looks like, because at that specific time period, we were just all building the same houses. There was a comfort in conformity, you know? And it, and it goes along to what, what we were talking about earlier, this like prescription for happiness. Like, oh, I need to get that house, check. White picket fence, check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so like, it was actually like pretty easy to find the locations that we needed because it was so cookie cutter at the time. And we, we also just had such an incredible group of collaborators and our department heads, you know, and our, our DP, Simon Dennis, and our production designer, Jamie McCall, who all worked to create this world because we wanted to convey a world where it was open but stifling wide open spaces and yet the sort of claustrophobia in there the sort of mundanity and repetition and dullness of this life without it being beige and uninteresting to look at you know and i think that they did an absolutely wonderful job of that and to your question about the source of the aesthetic i mean it robin is the showrunner and robin and mike Uppendahl, the director of the pilot and the finale and producing director really had a very unified vision from the beginning, from the script stage. I mean, I remember, you know, Robin and Mike talking about this from early on, how it shouldn't feel like a cliche of the 80s, but like a present day immersive feeling. Something about it just reminded me of uh, the look of uh, Zodiac, you know, Fincher's uh, Zodiac yes. and, it, and that same quality, filmy, dirty... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. kind of look yeah, I don't it know wasn't a happy you... time so you know like the, the drab <laughs> colors you know the brown station wagon it's just yeah you, you didn't need a title card to say what year it was for sure it was the golden age of the harvest tone palette yeah exactly exactly i was feeling very nostalgic for the avocado you know colored appliances and things like that exactly. i bet That's they're hilarious. coming back <laughs> The uh, the secret MVP is the hairstyles, right? Like, oh, wow. Yeah. Look at that, and, and you know. The glasses 100% gave it away. And uh, Pablo Schreiber's uh, leisure suit. That, <laughs> that's a lot of material. Indeed. <laughs> so I also watched all five episodes, and, and I loved it, and I could not believe that I hadn't heard of this story either. Robin, I'm also a very big true crime buff. I really enjoyed all five episodes so much. Just in coming out of like where you got with the source material and all of the information that you got, casting this now had to be a very daunting task because you want to get all of these essentials right. From our standpoint, the casting looks spot on. Can you share any notes or any stories about the casting and, and how that all came about for you? Yeah, I mean, we were very fortunate in that Jessica Beale is also a true crime weirdo fanatic, you know, like 
She's this is a good we, niche for her. Sorry to cut you. <laughs> it is. One of the first things we admitted to each other is both of us will just listen to serial killer podcasts to fall asleep to. Like, it's like a bedtime story. Same. <laughs> And she just got it right on and not only got it, but brought all of these elements to it that I hadn't even considered. She always saw Candy as this sort of um, undeniable radiation of positive energy. And that's what draws people into her. And it was so engaging because like it fit right in with my feeling that it's possible this woman is a malignant narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, they kind of just went hand in hand. And Jessica is just phenomenal in this. In fact, the first time she walked out of her trailer with the full hair, makeup, costume, and everything, people on her own team didn't even recognize her. Like, literally, it took them for a second. It was quite a transformation, for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, to be able to have Melanie Linsky, who just happened to have availability in her in her schedule then, like, yeah, try to book Melanie Linsky now. <laughs> She's just always been such the perfect synthesis and embodiment of vulnerability and power at the same time. That's just like a really potent blend. And, and it was the challenge with Betty of just like making her likable as well. That's the thing is like the challenge was we don't want to play up the sort of soapy aspects that you could find in this and make these people just monstrous. Like these are real human beings. You know, and, and real human beings are both angels and demons. And you couldn't find better than Melanie and Jessica for that. And then our guys, we had two giants, you know, we had Pablo Schreiber and Tim Simons, who are, you know, physical giants and, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, acting powerhouses. And, and the way that they were sort of like bookends of each other. It, it's it's not really clear like if there's really that much of a difference between the two that was sort of key to the story the four of them all just work together so cohesively and flawlessly that it, it, it we just were very 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 lucky to have gotten such this amazing foursome robin i, I remember when we did the first casting call with the uh, network or studio or whoever and they were like okay so for betty like who are you thinking like give us some types give us some types and you were just like the type is melanie linsky and i don't mean it's a type it's melanie linsky that's who it is so let's go find her yeah. availability end of discussion <laughs> It was hers. Yep. And you lucked out with the kids. I don't know if you lucked out, but yeah. but the kids were, none of them were obviously acting, if that helps. we I mean, we were delighted to find out there's just a wealth of incredible child actors in Georgia. You know, like, <laughs> I, I, I guess they're smart and they're all kind of like cooling up there. But like, every time we had to cast a child, we we're just like, great. <laughs> <laughs> it's raining <laughs> children, right? <laughs> Little Dash McLeod, he's going to be one to watch, as well as Avon and, and Antonella. The, all three of them are just going to be superstars. And they were probably the most professional people on set as well. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, like the little girl on uh, Quentin Tarantino's last movie. She's very professional. <laughs> exactly. They were all like that. They were just like, where's my mark? Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question for you about the way that the show is being dropped, right? So it's coming out. It's going to be one episode a day for five days. This is not a typical thing that we see anymore. Like we were getting like Paul and Caroline and myself, we were talking and we were getting some like movie of the week vibes from the seventies from this type of, of a drop. Is that a fair statement for where you guys were heading with this? Or what was your rationale for the way that this is being released? More than fair. I would actually say, like, it really excited me because we did have long discussions of how to release the show. There's many discussions to be had about, you know, making shows weekly or dropping them all at once so people can binge. Without getting into all that, my personal feeling is, like, that's a personal taste thing. Like, sometimes, because my schedule's so crazy, I'll just wait until the whole thing's out and then binge through it. Or, you know, if I have time, I'll watch week by week. But when we came up with this, because it's only five episodes, it just really took me back to my childhood when you would have the miniseries come out, like, you know, Shogun or The Thornbirds or something, and it's what you were doing all week. You know, right. like, your, your week was booked. You were good. Eight o'clock. <laughs> that's where I'm at. 
all week. That's what we're doing. And every year, every year, like it was either Thornbirds or, or Shogun. And we're just like, okay, like this is what we're doing every night this week. Right. right. Yeah. But it's also just, a, there's a little bit of maybe fun is not the right word dealing with this subject matter, but the fact that we premiere on Monday, May 9th means our finale happens on Friday the 13th. Nice. Which is just a gruesome coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. I know. Whenever you talk about true crime, you have to kind of preface it by saying, I promise you I'm not a psychopath. I just enjoy this because it's controlled scared. Your fear is controlled. <laughs> you know, hopefully if you do it right, you're feeding people's sort of natural desire for these horrifying stories because hopefully you discuss an issue at the end of the day. You you have something that's brought to light, like candy, it was important to us to sort of um, remind people that always try to impeach every opinion. Really think about what you're taking as truth. To me, good television or good storytelling in general is when you want to and need to discuss it with someone afterwards to make sure that what you understood was correct. Because maybe it's not. And we had very spirited arguments in the writer's room uh, among and different points of view among the writers of whether we believe Candy's story. It was a small writer's room. We had uh, Brett Johnson, who co-created Escape at Danamora, and Dave Matthews and Elise Brown. And all of us would be arguing over, you know, do we believe Candy? What should the verdict have been? And sometimes our opinions would change day to day. And we hope that the audience experiences some of that, too. As, a, as an audience member are at times sympathetic with what she's going through, despite, you know, you, you have laced in bits of the trial. So you kind of <laughs> know where this is, this is going to go, even if you didn't cheat and, and Google it. She's not completely monstrous. So, Nick, I'm looking at your IMDb here, and uh, one of my favorite shows from lockdown is one of your shows, Brand New Cherry Flavor, and which was... Not anything like this. <laughs> Although it did premiere on Friday the 13th. Oh, there you go. So what draws you to this darker side of human nature? What brought you from a very supernaturally fantastic subject back to Earth with candy? You know, I don't know the line between brand new cherry flavor and candy, except that I only want to make shows where I'm curious about someone's psychology. And I only want to be involved in making or producing dramatizations of real events where they answer a question that I can't get out of my head if I hear the story, which is, how could this have happened? And then... What did it feel like when it happened? And like I said, I, you know, I'd heard about this story 20 years ago and been thinking about it ever since. And Robin and I have worked together in the past. We met, uh, I don't know, what, like nine or 10 years ago. And at a certain point, I just, you know, we, we would share stories. And I thought, oh, my God. As Robin later described, it's like Mad Men with an axe murder. Um, <laughs> and, a, a, you know, I don't know any better dramatic or character writer than Robin. So I thought this would be a fantastic way to tell this story. And also, when we met on a job, this was one of my first jobs in TV, you know, Robin was really a, a mentor to me and gave me some advice, which is that, you know, the best situation you can be in in this industry is working with your friends on stories that you love. So I had a chance to do that here with her. But yeah, we were developing candy while Brand New Cherry Flavor was going on. And I, I really like to be able to move between worlds and there is a overlap between the horror genre and the true crime genre, certainly for, for stories like this, where there is a sense of dread along with all of the humor and humanity that's in there too. I have a controversial question because Nick, you touched on it a little bit before. Do you agree with the jury's verdict in Candy's case? I don't. However, we could spend another 40 minutes talking about all this, both Robin and I. I feel that Candy's story, the version that she told, is probably mostly true. I basically believe her. I still think she should have been convicted because you can't chop people up with axes because you got triggered because they said, shh, to you. Because I believe and empathize with Candy, but I also think she should have been convicted. Robin, same question. Depends on what day you ask me what's going on in my life at that point. That's why this story was so gripping to me. Literally, there, there's times where I can tap into the emotions of both of these women in their extremities. 
you know, I, I had a meeting on on another project where like a producer said something to me that sounded exactly like one of these nasty things that someone had said to me before. And I was like, if, if we weren't on Zoom, I would have slammed his head in the table 41 times and not broken a sweat. No problem. And of course, I would <laughs> never do that. But it's just the like, thought is that, yeah. The thought is there and I would never do it. So when we're storytellers and we're endeavoring to tell stories like this, I, I do think it's incumbent on you to do everything within your power to empathize with each of your characters. So yeah, it depends on when you ask me. But there are things about her story to me that seem plausible. And when we were shooting Jessica's side, you know, I'm just like, I believe her. And then, you know, we would shoot the prosecution side and I'm just like, she's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> so each of them are doing their job so effectively for you i couldn't hope for better in that situation and you know maybe it makes me a bad boss that like i didn't have a firm opinion depending on the day of the week but like nothing delighted me more than to be surrounded by these artists who are selling their version as best they can just for our listeners curiosity about tv making how does this process work? You have a creator, you have a showrunner. Robin just said she's the boss. <laughs> so how, how does that how does that element work behind the scenes? I mean, it depends on the show. Yeah, uh, Robin, do you want to jump in? Are we yeah, I mean, I, I think you kind of it depends on the show, and I think you kind of define it for yourselves. Nick and I love working together. He also is capable of doing many things at once, where I'm not really. <laughs> So, you know, Nick was the one who started this project and then brought me on and let me be the showrunner while he was the co-creator producer, you know, and so he was there to support every crazy thing that I wanted to do and also add his delicious two cents in as well. But I mean, th this is the relationship that we forged for ourselves. And also, we just allowed our co-conspirators, you know, like Mike Uppendahl, the director, our, you know, our actors, our department heads, we made them all partners in this because when you hire extremely talented people and then you just let them do their beautiful work, it just makes us look better. <laughs> And the, the other thing that I would add to that is, um, in addition to being extraordinary in front of the camera, Jessica Beale is a great producer. She and her producing partner, Michelle Purple, and my producing partner, Alex Hedlund, are all big parts of the process. And, you know, Jessica comes to every tech scout. She's on all the production meetings. She's a real meaningful, valued voice and was a true partner. You know, sometimes these things are like, uh, slap your name on it or whatever. Jessica's a dream to work with as a producer. Me, me calling myself the boss is just kind of like an inside joke because I'm just like held up by all these amazing people who are just like, what do you want to do, Rob? I'm like, what do we want to do? <laughs> but, you, but you are the boss. Somebody has, somebody has to be the boss and you know, make the final creative decisions and that's what you did. I get to win at the end of the day. <laughs> nice. Your, your chair is slightly taller than everybody else's. <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. Well, thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure talking to you and finding out more about what went into making this great new uh, mini series. Thanks for having us. This has been fun. Thank you. I'm glad. Thank you. We really enjoyed your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. This has been an original Pod Clubhouse production. Pod Clubhouse is a podcast network dedicated to encouraging collaboration among podcasters and friends to bring a fresh voice and diverse perspective on a wide array of content. Please visit and leave a comment for us at podclubhouse.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast feeds on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Pod Clubhouse. Our DMs are always open, and we'd love to hear from you. Pod Clubhouse.